Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen has recently proposed the lifting of import restrictions on American pork products into Taiwan. The decision has become immensely controversial in Taiwan here, and it has sadly become a partisan issue, which means that people aren't going to look at the merits of the decision itself, but instead, it's politics. In this video, I'm going to review the geopolitics and economics of the big deal in pork in Taiwan. So what is exactly happening here? On August 28, 2020, Tsai Ing-wen proposed at a press conference that Taiwan would lift bans on two specific things. First, beef from cattle more than 30 months old. This ban has been more tied to mad cow disease fears. Mad cow disease is less of a thing in Taiwan, so it's generally out of the news. The second thing is U.S. pork containing ractopamine, a livestock additive. This leanness enhancing drug would be allowed in trace amounts. The amount is in line with the minimum residue levels set by the Codex Alimentarius Commission in 2012, and more on this later. The amounts are 10 parts per billion in pork and beef meat, 40 parts per billion in livers, 90 parts per billion in kidneys. Ractopamine has been banned from Taiwan's domestic hog industry, which is in line with China's, and this ban continues on as before. Per the cabinet-level Council of Agriculture, the meat ban would be lifted January 1st, 2021. To support the domestic industry, the administration would take efforts to label and subsidize domestic pork products. An industrial fund of 340 million U.S. was announced. What is ractopamine? Okay, let's get the hard stuff out of the way first. Let's talk about the quote-unquote science. Ractopamine, which I'm going to call RAC for pronunciation's sake, is what the majority of the press and industry has been focusing on. Note that ractopamine has been allowed in Taiwanese beef imports since 2012. But Chinese and Taiwanese people eat a lot more pork than beef, and that includes organs such as intestines, kidneys, and the like. Why do U.S. pork farmers use it? Because it helps pigs gain more weight without more fat, and it makes them more money. Ractopamine is fed to pigs in the last 28 days of their lives. When added to feedstock, it binds to beta receptors in muscle cell membranes, which then increases muscle fiber size. Such pigs produce 10% more meat, which adds some $2 or more of profit per pig. This effect has been widely researched over the last 30 years. The United States FDA approved it for use in swine in 1999. The U.S. limit is some 50 parts per billion in cuts like beef and pork chops. Later, the drug was approved for cows and turkeys too. Some 25 other countries such as Brazil, Canada, Japan, Australia, Mexico, and New Zealand, amongst others, also allow it for their domestic pig and cattle industries. RAC is banned for use in domestic pork industries in 160 other countries, including the EU and Russia. One of the major issues related to this ban is in how RAC is fed to pigs shortly before their slaughter. Other leanness drugs require a two-week clearing period before slaughter. But since some 85% of RAC is excreted with very low level of tissue residues, waiting two weeks would invalidate the point of using it in the first place. Thus, it can be that people ingesting pork meat with this leanness drug may exhibit some of its effects which seems to act like some sort of muscle stimulant steroid of some sort. It's not been shown to be a carcinogen. The international politics of food safety standards are messy. And when people say that RAC is internationally accepted, the below is what, I, what they mean. July 5th, 2012, the Codex Elementaris Commission, which was created by the WHO and FAO in 1963 to develop food standards and guidelines voted very narrowly to adopt minimum residue levels of RAC. This decision, made by a really obscure panel most have almost never heard of, is frequently cited on both sides as reason for and against RAC usage. I'm going to briefly review the political wrangling involved with this decision. The Commission established an expert committee which reviewed RAC's toxicology, residues, and intakes in 1993 2004, 2006, and 2010. In 2004, it came up with the minimum residue levels, MRLs, of the 10 parts per billion for pork meat, 
that President Tsai is right now recommending for Taiwan, and which is far below the American FDA approved level, which to remind you, was 50 parts. In 2010, it reviewed the data again, but with regards to pig organs, like liver, kidneys, and fat, in direct response to Chinese concerns about high consumption of those organs. The 2010 review again found the 2004 MRLs to be compliant. The EU's European Food Safety Authority in 2009 criticized the Codex studies and the 2004 MRLs. Most Wikipedia artists will leave it at that, which I feel paints a biased image. Here's what the EFSA actually opined. The ESFA was not asked to produce its own study on RAC safety. It was instead asked to make an opinion on the Codex Commission subcommittee's science study. The ESFA opined that it cannot determine a minimum residue level, not that RAC is unsafe or toxic, or that the evil American pork industry is influencing the science. The EFSA made this opinion because of a component in the Codex Committee study, a sub-study on the drug's effects on human cardiovascular health. This component assumed that most people would eat some 0 to 1 micrograms of pork per kilogram of body weight per day, which is called the Acceptable Daily Intake, or ADI. According to the EFSA, ADI should not be assumed to be those levels because there is a subset of the population with substantially higher cardiovascular risk and they might be negatively affected when eating these muscular stimulants. It requested a bigger study with more human study subjects. It's on this basis that the EU continued to ban RAC after the Codex's eventual decision. So, so thus, 2012, the Codex voted 69 to 67, with seven abstentions to approve the MRLs. Why? The 26 countries already using RAC pointed out that it had been used for many years without noticeable reported ill effects. And no scientific consensus has come up in the years since when the original 2004 MRLs were proposed to overturn them. Of course, there are huge dissidents on each side, but what everyone could agree on was that the proper procedures as set out by the Codex's laws had been patiently followed. Thus, it needed to be approved so thus it was, by that incredibly tight vote. And you can think about what that means for you. Beyond effects in the humans, there are some animal welfare concerns as well. RAC's use seems to affect the pigs themselves. A 2003 study funded by the USDA found that pigs fed RAC beyond their fourth week tend to have elevated heart rates and increased stress levels. It made them more aggressive than usual and could lead to potential injury. This was also taken into account by the Codex in its approval of MRLs of the drug, which is a recorded first. So let's talk about geopolitics. Taiwan's export-related electronics economy has been humming. A surge in demand from the work-from-home economy has driven demand for their semiconductors, electronics hardware, and accessories. August 2020 exports totaled $45.5 billion, up for the sixth consecutive month, and over 13.6% year over year. This is really impressive. The United States is Taiwan's second largest trading partner after China slash Hong Kong. Two-way trade between the two areas in 2018 totaled $94 billion, which is half the size of trade between Taiwan and China. The US has seen the Taiwanese ban on pork and beef products as a significant barrier to better trade relations. This is per the Office of U.S. Trade Representatives 2018 and 2019 policy agenda. And it goes, The United States continues to express serious concerns about Taiwan's agricultural policies that are not based upon science. Priorities for the U.S. include removing Taiwan's bans on U.S. pork products and certain U.S. beef products produced using ractopamine and removing other barriers to U.S. beef offal products. So yes, this is a real barrier to establishing better trade relations between Taiwan and the U.S. But you know, considering how strong Taiwan's electronics and hardware industry already was, I wondered what a U.S. and Taiwan trade agreement would be focusing on. More laptops? Heavy industrial equipment? And it could be, nothing's off the table. But let's put on our tinfoil hats and talk some speculation. 
Reading the U.S. trade report, it appears that the talks between the U.S. and Taiwan authorities were not centered on semiconductors, gaming accessories, or laptops, but instead medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and copyright. Taiwan exported some 680 million of items classified as medical devices in 2019, and the U.S. has the world's largest import market for medical instruments, worth some 25 billion in 2018, which is the latest numbers I have. Opening up America's titanic healthcare market to Taiwan's medical instruments industry would be a huge boon for an administration looking to beef up that part of its economy. And then as for pharmaceuticals, this is a bit more murky and I'm just drawing lines between news items, so mark this with a big speculation alert. Starting in 2013 and continuing into 2016, China and Taiwan attempted to achieve regulatory convergence in the approval of pharmaceutical drugs. This would have supercharged Taiwan's pharmaceutical industry as it would have meant that drugs approved by Taiwan's version of the FDA could also be automatically sold into China's immense market without needing to go through the approval process all over again. But things changed after the DPP took power and it appears that the pathway to regulatory convergence has fallen through. Replacing the Chinese pharma market with the American pharma market could help Taiwan's pharmaceutical industry. But my reading of the trade report makes me less sure of this. There are still some substantial copyright issues that need to be overcome first. Okay, end of crazy speculation section. Ah, and one last thing. You can't construe this as a move by Taiwan to help Trump standing with rural voters in the US. The ban won't be lifted until after the election. Let's look at the domestic situation. President Tsai and her DPP party won comprehensive victories in the 2020 Taiwanese elections. Taiwan's economy has managed to avoid a crippling recession in 2020. Part of this is due to the greater number of exports, as mentioned earlier. But another part of this can be also tied to the bureaucracy's effectiveness in managing the pandemic. These two things have brought Tsai a substantial amount of economic and political capital, and it looks like she intends to spend it. And boy, oh boy, this decision is going to bring her some heat. First, there is the issue of the political opposition. In 2012, when the Codex first issued its decision, the DPP was not in power. The Guomindan was. The Guomindan's decision to let in beef with ractoptamine had caused protests. The DPP led the way in criticizing the Guomindan administration for doing so. So yes, her administration is going to look like hypocrites now. Secondly, there's an economic issue. When poorly done, globalization can accelerate the hollowing out of an economy and encourage brain drain. More competitive foreign products in a domestic market can snuff out jobs for people who need them. Taiwan is no longer an economy heavily reliant on exporting agricultural products. Foodstuffs don't even appear in the top 10 and are less than 2% of total exports. However, its domestic agricultural industry is critical for national security reasons. Hong Kong independence was and is impossible for so many different reasons. But among the top, amongst others, is the fact that its water and food supply always depended on friendly relations with the mainland. In addition, Taiwan's economy is distributed unequally. Many of the top performing electronics manufacturers are in Taiwan's north and west areas. The economies of Taiwan's more rural south and east areas are more agricultural based and tourist based. These are some of Taiwan's Rust Belt areas, and they need the jobs. The government is going to establish an industry fund to help the domestic pork industry, which right now supplies some 90% of the Taiwan market. At the same time, it's unveiling a series of measures and cute designs to make it clear to consumers when they're buying Taiwanese pork products. So that's good, but more competition is naturally going to hit the industry, and there will be consequences. It appears that the DPP is going to lean on its electoral advantages in the South to maintain power throughout these challenges. So in conclusion, this is a long and complicated video and saga with twists and turns. We try to analyze as objectively as possible the risks, the benefits of the move, as well as its costs. In the end, it looked like Tai looked hard at the current economic situation and decided that this move could achieve multiple benefits on multiple levels. Let's go see if it works. All right, I'm done with this. I'm gonna go eat some pork rice.